welcome to episode six of Reinventing School. This is still a new experience for all of us. Uh, we have a full house today, and we're talking about the intersection of media, real life, and learning. And I thought, originally thought this was going to be an episode about, you know, how impactful is Sesame Street in learning or something like that. But we, we wandered into something much more meaningful and something that kind of changed a lot of my thinking in a day. So yesterday I spent the day watching, and I'm recommending you guys spend, everybody out there, uh, spend the weekend watching a, uh, an extraordinary documentary series that I will tell you about in a minute. Um, but first, I'd like to introduce uh, Julie Hall, uh, who I learned a lot about yesterday, and I've been really looking forward to meeting him in person, or at least as close as one is allowed to meet somebody in person in this part of 2020. So, Julie, um, where are you? And, and uh, tell us a little bit about what you do now. Uh, yes, it's Jewel, Howard. Jewel, uh, I'm sorry, Jewel. No worries, no worries at all. I'm used to being called Julie. I'm actually, uh, I enjoy it. But um, in any case, uh, I'm currently in Queens, New York, uh, where I live in a brownstone by myself. So, you know, social isolation is no problem for me. And I'm sorry, what was the other part of the question? And, and what do you do for work? Oh, so I'm currently a program associate for the Ford Foundation, where I conduct data analysis and strategy development for its unit of gender, racial, and ethnic justice. That sounds a little technical. So tell us what you do every day. Uh, so basically every day I review grants, talk to funders about the way in which their grants align with an already laid out strategy. Uh, so, for example, uh, many of our grants are focused on racial equity. So, you know, I review the grants, the purpose, the employees to make sure that this organization fits that uh, idea of racial equity. How did you learn to do that? Uh, from school. <clears throat> Excuse Tell me. Tell me about school. From my, my experience with the Bard Prison Initiative, uh, I basically took on some really challenging work with my classes with BPI. <clears throat> Excuse me, the work was uh, really dense reading and I had to really sit and engage and define and understand the work. It was a benefit to have a group of students and friends who are now friends uh, by my side because we would throw ideas off each other and help each other to figure out the work. Yesterday, I spent the day watching, I'll get the title right, College Behind Bars. Do I have that right? Okay. There you go. Um, and I watched a four hour version that anybody can watch if you're in the education space because it's on, you just go to college, you just do the search and then you'll find an education link and you can watch four hours, which is what I did. Um, and I was humbled. Um, but I was humbled for reasons that I didn't see coming and then it became quite emotional. Uh, I realized how how much I underestimated what I could learn in mm -hmm. a lifetime. And I realized that we're probably all capable of a lot more than school or society permits us or grants us. What I saw, and maybe you could describe it a bit, and then I'll introduce uh, some of the folks who were who made the film uh, or the films. Um, you were surrounded by people who were studying in great depth, very complex ideas or very complicated ideas, mm -hmm. um, and then articulating ideas and in front of class and professors at a level that I'm not sure I've ever been exposed to. So can you explain what that dynamic was? What it was like learning in that environment? And these were all adults, right? We should point that out. That's a great point. That's one of the things that I wanted to uh, highlight is that we were all adult learners, so we brought a level of experience. However, there was a disadvantage to that. Many of us came from schools that didn't serve us well, so we had to catch up to a degree. We had to catch up with the grandma, with some of the fundamentals in order to get to the complex ideas. But Howard, to answer your question, I think the, the secret sauce was just the fact that we relied on each other. 
you know, my classmates, we built such a fraternity because of the degree of difficulty with the work. Yes, it was very difficult and our professors did not let up on us, but we relied on each other to study, to review each other's work and to make it through. What was your major? I majored in German studies. Had you spoken German before you became in, involved with the with the BPI? Nine. Okay. So, <laughs> <laughs> um, first, how did you do that? But second, what were some of the other people studying? Because you guys really went deep and wide. So, just to illustrate a bit, you know, we had German class twice a week. And we had, we had the fortune of having students from the campus who spoke German to come in and tutor us. However, we also devoted at least an extra day. So that's five days out of the week where we would sit together and practice our German with each other. So again, it goes back to this idea of fraternity and the way in which when you're in a class with people, you can benefit so much from another person's uh, perspective that, you know, we realized that and used it to the fullest. What were some of the other students studying? Uh, we have studies, students who studied Mar excuse me, Mandarin Chinese. I can speak German, but not English. Uh, we had uh, calculus, uh, complex calculus, uh, chemistry, biology. Uh, we have, I think my, my all-time favorite is the humanities and the liter literature classes because as adult learners or any learner, uh, the humanities give you an example to compare your life experience with. So I think that was the most instructive for us about systems in the world and how to navigate complexity because we had you know, the works of Shakespeare and the characters in Shakespeare to be able to uh, get an example on how to navigate complexity. You guys, it blew me away. Um, I, I want to talk more to you, but I also want to introduce Sarah Botstein and Lynn Novick. Um, you certainly know their work uh, because you've seen it on television, because you guys have been part of Ken Burns Florentine Films organization for a long time, right? In both cases. Uh, so let's do a quick hello. And then I'm, what I'm hoping is that you'll get to how I guess, Sarah, this is a question more for you and initially because you share a last name with somebody who runs a college that seemed to have a university that's involved in this. So can you explain how did this happen? How did, how did this story emerge? How did it get told? Explain who your father is and make the music connection as well because none of us just does one thing. <laughs> I'll, I'll talk a little bit about my relationship to Bard, but I'll toss the how we ended up making the film over to Lynn because it's, 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 it's an origin story that's to both of us, but I think um, she's great answering that question. I grew up on the Bard College campus. My father is um, president there and has been for more than 45 years. It was a really amazing place to grow up. He's also a musician and a conductor, and I feel grateful for having grown up on a college campus. I knew a little bit about the Bard Prison Initiative, not a lot. I'm 48 years old. I left home and went to college and BPI was founded after that actually. Um, and had been to a graduation and knew a little bit about it, but it wasn't until Lynn and I had finished a film that we made on the history of prohibition and um, we got invited to, to go to Eastern and I'll let her tell a little bit about that. But I will say, you know, I think Bard is an amazing institution, but I really came to make this film because of the work that I did with Ken and Lynn and sort of the ironic intersection of, of my life and my work. So that was just a lucky accident, actually. It was completely serendipitous. Um, in 2012, we were invited to present Prohibition to a college class. We've been going around the country with and without Ken Burns and different events showing clips from our film and talking about the stories we had learned and the lessons for our time. And we got the chance to speak to a group of students in the Bard Prison Initiative. And, um, you know, it was a life altering experience as you have seen from watching the film, walking into the classroom and engaging with the students and having the kind of sophisticated conversation that you saw happening in our film. We had that in person. And 
it totally blew our minds, frankly. Um, and as we were walking out of the classroom, before we even got to the first gate, we looked at each other and we said, oh my God, this is incredible. We had no idea that this was happening here. This would be an amazing film. Um, but we were just starting our series on the Vietnam War with Ken Burns. We were actually just about to go to Vietnam for one of our many trips there. And you know, we weren't thinking that we would do it. I actually got in touch with Max Kenner, the director of the program, and just said, I'm amazed by what you're doing and how can I help you? What can I do? How can I get involved? And lucky for me, he said, how would you like to teach a course? So I ended up becoming a, a guest professor for half a semester the next year and taught a course on documentary and history. And while that was happening, and Sarah taught several classes with me and other filmmakers came in to talk about our, our process and what we do and what is history, we decided we just had to make this film. And we, we felt very strongly that what we wanted the film to be was something that would accrue over time. You'd get to know students as they were going through this incredibly transformative experience of getting this education. And we also wanted to be sure we could find a student who was hopefully going to be released from prison and we could see what that journey was like. And Jewel was generous enough to let us um, participate in his process of, he had already finished his degree and he was working his way toward coming home. And he's incredibly generous. I mean, we just feel so lucky that we've gotten to know and become great friends with Jewel and many of the other students that shared their stories with us over four years. So none of us really knew what we were getting into when we started. That was 2014 when we first met. So it's been a long journey for all of us. It's been a long journey. And, and it's not, when you say a film, actually there are four films that are each about an hour and 40 minutes long. And then there's a classroom version that's about an hour long of each of them. Is that about right? Yeah, we think of it as one film, a four part series. So, okay. you know, that's how we think of our Vietnam War as a, as a film, which is 20 hours long, so. You might and, be talking about, we have, we've made clip reels of various lengths for classrooms and for teachers and for, um, right. the, for the education space, but the actual movie is a four hour film in one part episodes. Right. Well, let's, let's have a little, Michael, we, I'd like you to play for us the four voices clip. Um, it's just so everybody gets a bit of a sense of the people who were talking about and the environment in which they were learning. The majority of prisoners in New York State come from New York City. And they come from the worst neighborhoods in New York City. That also have the worst schools in New York City. That have the lowest quality of education in New York City. And then they wound up in prison. College was not something that was on their radar. Gene therapy. Let's kind of sketch out the, the uh, terrain of, of what we're talking about here. People trying to get in a bard, they never know what it is like until they get in. We try to convince someone that this is worth doing. They say, well, you know, I don't want to be up all night. Like, look at you guys. But it's worth it. And they say, why? And you can't answer that question because it's not something you know until you get in the classroom with really, really great professors and they start teaching you how smart you are. Carla, so we're still talking about why this is such a matter of heated ethical debate. Well, one of the main concerns with stem cells is that there's this right that future generations have that we will be basically impeding. Terrific, very well put. BPI was the most challenging thing I've ever undertaken academically. Before then, everything I did academically was easy. That wasn't. But as I struggled and I worked hard and I, and I started taking my education to another level, I started kind of feeling cheated cheated by my early education, by my high school education, the fact that it wasn't challenging enough. There is a, a dual educational system in this country, one for individuals who will rule and one for everyone else. And there's something inherently wrong and short-sighted in this because it takes for granted all the potential that lies at that other level. 
that they never get an opportunity to meet their potential. And what's the ramification of that for American society? I'm feeling as though most people, and not only in the United States, but in the world, are getting educated way below their potential. Um, I have the great benefit, and you'll see a plug on this a little later, to be traveling the world, talking to children and teenagers in many different settings, all, all incomes, many different countries. And the feeling that I walk away with every time is, gee, these kids are really smart, and the school isn't giving them the fuel that they deserve, they need, that society needs, and all that. So with that, um, I... I want to introduce Raven and Owen. You guys are both students in North Carolina, and I'm hoping that uh, you'll tell us a little bit about yourselves. All right, I'll go. So my name is Owen. I'm a rising senior at South Mech, and I'm on the soccer team. Um, I honestly, like this quarantine, I've been I've been looking for a job. I just had an interview of you a few days ago at Panera Bread, so hopefully I get get some back on that. Um, um, I'm, st I'm looking at colleges. I've been um, uh, doing virtual tours of uh, certain colleges. I've been uh, doing like uh, career tests just to see where I, where I should go, like what my uh, interests are as I grow further in life. But um, what are your interests? What are you learning so, about? What do you like learning about? Um, what do I like learning? I like, I like history. Um, that could, I like like Egyptian history. Um, Whoa, well, that, cause that's like kind of a random thing, right? So yeah. Egyptian history, can you build us the, the path? Honestly, I have, there? I don't know where that came from. Like, I just remember, in, I think it was seventh grade. Um, I just had like a good, like, it was like one of the most interesting things I learned was just the, the about the Egypt, Egyptians and how they lived their lives. And I just, Cause like we get a lot of our technology today from them. Like they put the blueprint down and we just, we develop it even more. Um, and that's, that's a lot of what history is. We just take what they made and just make it more advanced. So I think that's just what, what interests me about it. Raven, can we hear you? Hi, my name is Raven. Um, I'm 17. I'm also a rising senior at South Met. Um, I am the president of the NAACP at my school. I enjoy art, like painting and everything. And I enjoy social justice issues, learning about them, figuring out ways to combat them. And yeah, during quarantine, I've just been, I've been talking with my friends on ways to get involved in Charlotte, especially with everything going on, things we can implement, especially in our schools and everything. I have also been looking at colleges and scholarships and yeah, it's pretty much it. What are you interested in learning or what, what fascinates you? I'm interested in learning about psychology and also African-American history. Those are two things that I'm very passionate about. Learning about art. Yeah. Those are How did things. psychology happen? Where did that come from? I don't know, because it was never really on my radar when I was younger. I always, I never knew what I'd want to be, even in kindergarten. They would ask me and I'd say, I don't know. And now I just kind of thought about it. And I was like, it's kind of cool how mysterious the mind is, how we don't know most about it. And I took a psychology class and not going to lie, the teacher wasn't very good. But I really enjoyed the... <laughs> I really enjoyed the material in it. So I was like, even in this class where I know I didn't get the best teaching and I still enjoyed the material, I knew that was something for me, something that I like to do. We're going to say a brief hello to Maura, who is, I believe, the teacher responsible for both Owen and uh, Ed Raven, at least helping us get in there. But Maura, I'm going to ask you a different question before we go to a break. What are you learning about? Uh, I'm learning about myself. I'm learning about my students. I'm learning about the world. I am learning as they are about social justice issues, especially, you know, with everything again that's happening today. And I just want to go back to what Sarah had said earlier about, you know, things being a lucky accident. And for me, Owen and Raven and the other students in the course that I teach, let me just say I'm not the psychology teacher. 
Um, it's a course in regards to social justice issues. It started out as peer tutoring, but it turned into something much bigger. And I'm much more passionate about what I do each and every day that I go in. But what are you specifically interested in learning about tomorrow? Like, give me a thing. Like, if I could grab a book on that, that's what I want to know about. I, I'm just being drawn towards that. How to create change to make um, progress in where we are, honestly. A lot of this just seems, you know, a lot of that that's going on just seems, you know, like a no-brainer. But then we, we have a lot of work to do. So I want to learn about the work I need to do and how I need to bring that into the classroom to make a collective change that we need to make. Yeah, why is this so hard? This is a weekly series that we started in order to be able to begin to answer that question or help educators to do that. Uh, and we're going to have a quick look now, take a break, uh, and look at some of the episodes that are coming up. You'll get a fuller sense of what it is we're doing. Jewel, you've seen your fair share and, and heard your fair share of stories, more than your fair share of stories about social justice and the direct impact of all that. We're going through a period now where suddenly everybody's interested in social justice. What happened? Uh, a lot has happened, a lot, too much actually. Uh, I just think that you know the interest in social justice is so phenomenal. Uh, I grew up in the 80s when you know people from brownsville brooklyn were demonized as super predators i went with through a lot of struggle to uh identify who i am as a person and not the messages i was receiving from society but i bring that up to say now we're in 2020 and people are so passionate about self-determination about social justice about equity it's really beautiful i don't know what brought us here but I think we're in a good space to move forward. Lynn, when I talk about, or I guess Lynn and Sarah, when I try to explain what's happening to others, I can't help but go back to the Vietnam era because that was a period of very, very vibrant social change. And there are certainly big differences, but do you say, can you kind of connect some of the dots or tell me that we're wrong and this is a very different era? Um, I think we'll probably both chime in. It's, um there are a lot of echoes and there's a lot of threads or seeds that were sown there that are coming to, you know, coming to the fore right now. We are very polarized and that polarization started really in the early sixties. Um, but it seems like an awakening that's kind of different now than anything that happened around civil rights particularly during the sixties. Uh, to me, what feels really different is the kind of scale and scope and sustaining nature of the protests and um, how grassroots it is. And that's a function of our social media and the way we all communicate and the lockdown and so many other things. There's no single leader or leaders that are driving this. This is happening from the bottom up in the most beautiful and incredible way. And there are very important leaders in Black Lives Matter and you know civil rights leaders, but somehow there's something organic happening that feels different. The only thing that it kind of reminds me of is um, the moratorium, which we had a beautiful scene about in the film where around the country, everybody stopped to take a minute to protest the Vietnam War. And that was in small towns and big cities, but it was just one day. This, this feels really different. Uh, Sarah, sure. you, yeah. Yeah, I think the word echo, Lynn and I have obviously talked a lot about this in the last few weeks and um, I think, as Maura said, this a lot, a long time coming, and it's a, it's a very beautiful and very painful moment for the country. I would say, in its own reckoning, for me, there are, as Lynn said so beautifully, echoes from 
the Vietnam film from different uh, of uh, the witnesses, the people that we interview who lived through the time. And I was actually telling my nine-year-old um, after Kent State, the writer Tim O'Brien said, he, you know, he was so tortured, he didn't know what to do. He, it was such a complicated time for the country, but he just felt he knew something was wrong. We were killing our own people and we had to go out into the streets and protest. And, you know, I am in a rural part of upstate New York and I put my kids in the car and went to a protest with them for the sa that same exact reason. I think people all over the country in a sustained way, small towns and big cities want to make better on the promise of what this country can be. And we have systematically since Vietnam done a lot to make sure we haven't done that. And I, it's, it's an amazing moment to be alive. I, for Raven and Owen, I can't imagine being um, a rising senior in high school. You guys are in one of the most exciting times in American history, I think. And we are lucky to have students like you coming behind us. When I think about the scriptures that Raven and Owen need to refer to. The best scripture I can think of is your films, film or films, the Vietnam War. So we flip the model now. In some ways, if I was a teacher, and Maura, I'm hoping you will, uh, it, you will respond here because you are a teacher, um, to teach the Vietnam War, to pull those elements together um, and have the resources you did, because at the time, according to my research, it was $30 million worth of filmmaking. That's a lot of money. That's a lot of teachers to hire. That's you know, hundreds of teachers for a year in terms of salary. But you created something that has long-term value and tells a story in a balanced way, or the best you could do to tell it in a balanced way. But there's so many facets. And I can't hand Raven or Owen a book or five books and let them see the pictures, let them hear the voices. So in some ways, thank you for doing what you're doing, but is what you're doing eliminating the need for the primary learning experience? Is it, the, is it Vietnam War, the films first, followed by a teacher explaining and interacting? Because I can't imagine how a teacher could possibly teach what you've taught in the level of detail with the richness. But I'm not going to ask either of you to answer that just yet. I'm going to go to Maura. And feel free to use college or uh, Vietnam as, as our example. And then I'll come to, back to the filmmakers. OK, yeah. Um, thank you. I'm going to use college behind bars because I'm not a history teacher. I'm a former English teacher. So I taught English prior to going to my principal and saying that I wanted to start a peer tutoring program during the school day because the kids can't stay after like Owen, he's got sports and they have jobs and you know they have to catch buses and things like that. And so she gave me the green light to create this program because I had seen the benefits of students helping students in ways sometimes as educators and adults, we sometimes lose that connection with those students to be able to explain things in a way that they need. And so I developed this peer tutoring program seven years ago, um, I had 11, uh, tutors total that first year. I'm now over a hundred every year of these peer tutors. And South Mecklenburg High School is one of the largest high schools in the country. It is, I think, the second largest in North Carolina. We have 3,400 students in our high school. And one of the reasons I love South Mec is because of its diversity. And one of the things this program has allowed me to do is connect worlds that never would have been connected before because typically the tutors are um, middle to upper class white students and sometimes they're going out to classes of low income students of color. And so those worlds are connecting in ways that never would have been connected before. And so it was a few years ago that I was introduced to the book, Just Mercy by Brian Stevenson. And I brought that in because I thought it would help us all in regards to the social justice issues that were going on. A few months ago, I received an email across my desk in regards to College Behind Bars. One of the major themes in Just Mercy is mass incarceration. And some of the things that we learned and that I've taught the kids and that they've taught each other, because I've challenged the students, don't end the conversation in this classroom. You have to go out, go talk to your friends in the lunchroom, go talk to your families at dinner, talk to your teammates and see what they say about these things. Because when I look at Raven and Owen, it breaks my heart to think at their age group, one in 15, of 
the boys is expected to go to prison, but one in three African-American boys Owen's age is expected to go to prison. So it's opened our eyes to realize something is wrong. Something's going on and we need to figure out a way to prevent this from happening. And so that's where College Behind Bars really just tied in so well with the social justice issues, specifically mass incarceration and bringing humanity. You know, as educators, we're constantly handing out textbooks and you know, uh, literature to students is saying, here, you have to read this, here, you have to read this. And although I've told my students here, you have to read Just Mercy, College Behind Bars just ties right back in with it in regards to they see someone like Jewel, who is kind and caring and compassionate, you know, that his crime doesn't get to define who he is, and that all of us have made mistakes, and that sometimes we need to justify, you know, giving grace to some individual. So College Behind Bars has been a blessing in disguise for me and is one of those happy accidents that came across my email a few months back. I so want to hear from Jewel, but I want to talk to Raven first. What do you make of this? And tell me what you know about the Vietnam War. Do you know much? Um, I would say I don't know very much about the Vietnam War. I'm not going to lie. <laughs> That's okay. But, but as to what Miss Max said, I'll completely agree. Her class is just amazing. And I think that there should be a class like hers in every single school because just the things that she, I find, I consider myself a very pretty conscious person, but the things that she brings up, it's just like, you can never learn too much in her class and the connections that we made together and becoming even more aware of the systemic issues in our country was just very eye-opening. And I could see it being very eye-opening to all my classmates. So, Jewel, how does it feel to have opened some eyes? Oh, uh, it's so, I'm honored. I am so honored. It wasn't my intention. I will say, however, that while I was in prison and taking barred P BPI classes, I knew we were doing something special that people needed to see. You know, uh, there's a couple of themes that we spoke upon here. And one of them is the tension between maybe uh, classroom learning and movies. Now we live in a culture in which movies are so popular. Uh, documentaries are teaching people now. For me, I believe that you have to meet people where they are and uh, provide them with the uh, tools to learn that they are more comfortable with. And for some, it may be watching a documentary. For others, it may be reading a book. But nonetheless, I think what's important is that we are in a society that prides itself on being diverse, but we only have one way of teaching. And uh, it, it's not doing a service to many of the students, Raven and Owen's age, because you know, uh, there needs to be a gap that's filled between high school and college. With adult learners, we had an even greater gap, but it's known in our society that many of our high school students are not entering college prepared to take on that challenging work. And I think it's really important that we understand that with diversity comes uh, diverse ways of learning, and we have to meet people where they are. So, Lynn, you raised eyebrow when I said, well, maybe Vietnam War is the teacher. And uh, yeah, I think on behalf of our entire team, we would never want a film that we made to be the end of learning. It's really the beginning. It's opening a conversation. It's opening a door. It's hopefully piquing someone's interest. And, you know, we know that most high school students are not going to watch all, you know, however many hours of the Vietnam War series, but teachers have taken pieces of it and we make that available too in little clips that maybe can be used thematically, like what is patriotism? What, you know, what are the goals of foreign policy? Um, what, you know, what is the nature of combat? You know, how we other people from other places. So, you know, for example, in Vietnam War, we specifically focused on making sure to represent Vietnamese perspectives, who if you get a textbook on the Vietnam War, it's not gonna, it's gonna be like as if it only happened to Americans. So for us, it was important to just kind of reframe the whole idea of the Vietnam War as not solely an American experience. So you don't have to watch the whole film to kind of get that idea. So I think, you know, we've engaged a lot with teachers over many, many years to come up with ways to kind of take bites out of our films and, be, and they are very useful in the classroom. But it's, it's sort of, on the one hand, we don't expect someone to watch a film passively and learn what's in it and then feel like they know that. 
On the other hand, it's a great way to get people interested. And we've so got 20 hours, right? And, and, and in, yeah. in the case of college behind bars, how, however, six hours four, or whatever. Four hours. hours, yeah. By throwing myself into that experience yesterday, I learned so much more than I could have with a clip. I, I began to understand the humanity of this. I began to understand how little I know, both about your major themes in the film, but also how little I know about the topics that the students in the film were talking about. I was like, yeah, I have a long way to go. Um, when you go to work every day, you're carrying much more responsibility than maybe you realize. You may be the only source of information for a whole lot of people about the Vietnam War or about uh, about a college behind bars. This may be the only experience that many of the people who see this uh, have. So it's a big burden. Sarah, you look like you're gonna jump in. No, no, I just wanna say a little bit about our process. It's a huge compliment. I am not, I mean, we take our work very seriously. Lynn and I, I, before COVID, spent more time with Lynn over the last 24 years than anyone else in my life. And um, feel very, very lucky to have that job. And we do take it very seriously. And one of the reasons we work in the space we work in is, is because we, we love education and we think our films can help inspire people to learn about the subjects we make films about. Um, but we can't make those films without primary source materials. And we make our films with we work really, really closely with the academics, writers, social historians, journalists who are experts in those subjects. And we feel incredibly privileged and they hold our feet to the fire and they're part of our apparatus. And so I think, you know, the best history is often, whether it's a book or a film or a piece in a newspaper or even for Raven and Owen is a story, is somebody's personal relationship to that history, a story from that time that interests you. It's, a, it's personalizing the history um, and then getting the facts right. For a film like Vietnam, there's no book that agrees on what happened. So it's a, was, you know, Ken likes to say that our films are a process and a journey of discovery and that's, True, and as is life, and you, you know, I do think one of the lessons we took from making College Behind Bars is how you started the conversation, that you can learn at any age. Uh, Owen, let's come back to Egypt for a sec. So I'm guessing that neither Lynn nor Sarah has on their list the history of ancient Egypt as a next documentary. Um, no, I love that. That's what you're interested in. <laughs> But now, so you're, and really, if you want to have the book, the really best selling book about the era, it's probably the Passover Haggadah. Mm -hmm. Beyond that, where you go, how are you learning about this? Because they, because if they're not going to do a documentary about it, I'm guessing your teachers are not experts in the history of Egypt. So, how do you learn it? Yeah, so the thing about like in school learning is like you get one unit. And sometimes Egypt is a part of the unit, is a chapter of the unit. So you don't get that much. You get like the, the big main pictures, the wars, what happened, maybe some little stuff in between, but you don't get like the full experience. So honestly, I mean, a documentary would be pretty interesting just because then you would probably be able to see the whole story, the whole, every war, like all the little things would be inside the documentary. But in the, in the textbook, there's one unit on it. You get that one unit and you're done. You, you get nothing else. One of the best way, and I'm speaking here probably for Lynn and Sarah, because I, I had my share also of using media to tell stories. Um, so Owen, the best way to learn about Egyptian history, or one of the best, is go make a documentary about it. Mm -hmm. You get so deep into the material that for a minute and a half, you feel like an expert. And then you meet somebody and you're completely humbled. But Lynn, Sarah, how often has that happened to you where you walked into a situation, you didn't know a whole lot, and you were so steeped in it that it became your entire life? Every project. Every film. Yeah. <laughs> but you know, like we don't have that many films on our resumes because these projects take a really long time. So we spent five years on the history of jazz. I spent four years on the history of baseball, four years on, um, well, seven years on the Vietnam War and six years on World War II. So you know, we're never become the experts, but we do begin to feel like we've 
grasp enough to tell the story. And, you know, it's also true that someone else could make a film on the same topic with the same advisors and the same interview subject and have a completely different film, which you would, you know, it's, there's so much in the process of just making decisions and choosing what stories we think are the most telling. And, you know, what makes us the happiest is if someone maybe watches half an episode in the classroom and then goes home and watches a little bit more or reads a book. I've always felt like if you saw a piece of something we did and then went home and read a book or interviewed your grandfather or, you know, took that journey of curiosity to another place, we've, we've done our job. That's really our goal is to engage people's curiosity and realization that you don't know everything and here's something more you could learn. Right. When we were making Vietnam, somebody said to us, oh, you guys, you know, like courageous conversations. So we, we do try to promote courageous conversation. So if you go home and ask your grandfather or your friend or your neighbor something about a contentious topic and you have a civilized conversation, we've definitely uh, happy. There are so many different things, so many different directions we can take this conversation. But first, we're going to take a break. We'll be right back. about social yes. justice how do you learn that is that something that you learn through media is that something that you learn by watching television by reading books by studying some form of a scripture how do you how do you get at this um i would say all of the above but i would also add speaking to people speaking to different mentors and family members, because a lot of my family grew up in the Deep South, like my grandmother's generation, when all of the civil, the civil rights era, era was going on, and there, I'm noticing a lot of parallels, so I've been speaking a lot with them recently to kind of get like how they grasped those times, what they did, what I can do, and just learning about the different things in this country that have been established from the beginning and what we can do to help dismantle that. Jewel, how oh, do you yeah. teach civil rights, right? How do you teach civil rights? Yeah. Well, I think one part of it is by reviewing books, reviewing movies, and talking to people. But I think it's an important element that we must always recognize uh, that is part of education. Education is an action that happens with a person. You have to interact with that book, that media uh, platform, that person, you have to make it yours to a degree. You have to find something in it that drives you or interests you or draws your curiosity. It's an interactive process. It's not learning just for the sake of, okay, I know how to build the ship. That's good. You'll be able to provide for yourself and travel. But if you're not examining yourself, there's no growth. If you're not looking at that tool of media that you're interacting with, to see something in you that resonates with you. Like Owen said, I would love to investigate further why he liked Egyptian, Egyptian history, but I'm pretty sure it's a story. There's a, a, a artifact. There's something that resonated with Owen. Ask him. So Owen, what, what is it that resonates with you about Egypt? What draws your attention and interest in Egypt? I don't know. I think it's just like they were, it was just such the, the uh, the society was the environment back then. I mean, it was thousands of years ago, but it was just so, so different than what it is now, than what, how we are now. But like, like I said before, they created, they created the small things and we just built off of that. Like we created so many more, like they were like the first ones to create like the plumbing system. And like, look what we've done now. Like look, look at our plumbing system. Now it's like, they've, they started the, they started the creations. We've just built up from that. So I want to, 
it would be cool to see the other inventions that they had and what and how we have built up from that. And so. the point you're making is that from Egypt, you're able to understand your world today. And that's what's the interactive process. Yeah. You're able to say, wow, I took for granted my, plumb yeah. my plumbing system. Yeah. I see that it's an intricate process that goes back centuries. Mm -hmm. So that's education. That's the activity of education, not just learning something from a platform, but interacting and bringing yourself to that uh, platform so that you can grow. And that, you know, that's my opinion, but that is what has made my experience with BPI so phenomenal because everyone in the class did just that. We didn't just take the knowledge and say, okay, that's good to know. We took the knowledge and said, what does that tell me about me and the world in which I live? Connection between Egypt and civil rights. I'm kind of looking at both Owen and, and Raven. Well, I mean, uh, there's definitely, there was definitely slavery in um, Egypt and ancient Egypt. So, and <laughs> We had, we had slavery in the United States a while back, and I think that still, we still have to figure out how to, ch how to change. Like I th one of the quotes, I don't know if this is word for word, but I've heard from Miss Mac this year, and like really sticks to you is, uh, slavery hasn't, isn't gone. It's just changed. Like there's a diff, it's a different form of slavery now. It's it's not the, it's not like the, the workers on the field, but it's more of a, just a civil rights and people not getting the same rights as others that's what slavery is now it's yeah it's changed miss mac if i can call you that um the um i'm i'm sensing a connection that i'm sure i hadn't made before which is when we read the haggadah for passover every year we're telling a civil rights story to one another Jewel has had some Passovers at Lynn, so I'm seeing him nod his head. Uh, exactly. Jewel has been to Passover at my house multiple times, and we are always mindful of the connections. Explain the connections then. One of you, please. All right, Jewel. Jewel? Yeah. Well, you know, we made a lot of uh, connections in this last Passover between the COVID-19 experience and the plague that, you know, came across Egypt. We make relations between Moses as a leader who was uh, facing something really big, bigger than him, you know, in the Pharaoh, in the nation that was Egypt. So these are uh, affinities with uh, civil rights and Martin Luther King and, you know, the idea of people who were only nominally free or people who were released and chose to find ways to keep themselves enslaved. There's so many lessons. This is why I love these stories, because there's so many lessons that you could grab from them, whether what resonates with me may not resonate with Raven or Owen or whomever, but the fact that we could all read it together and discuss it together is the magic of education to me. Raven, are you feeling that? Yeah, I feel that. And I actually want to address another point that Jewel made a little earlier when he was saying that how you, when you learn about something, how you actually learn is when you relate it to yourself. And I want to say that I had that same feeling when I first took African American studies at my school, because in the past when I had taken, you know, American history, I've never felt very interested in it because I was just like, what does this have to do with me? What does this have to do with my people? How do I fit into all of this? But then once you learn your history and the true history of this country, when you have something that you can actually connect to yourself, I feel like that's just a whole different level of education. So I just want to say that. Uh, Maura, you're listening to this. Are you feeling like maybe your teaching is working? Oh gosh, I hope so. <laughs> I do. I really do because I stay connected with a lot of the alumni as well. And it's kind of neat seeing, you know, with everything that's going on, I'm seeing where they are and they're, you know, messaging back to me about all the things that they remember learning in the class and how that's really connecting with them now and what's going on and the differences that they're hoping to make. So, yeah, I mean, I believe in what I'm teaching. 
every day that I go in there, I believe in what I'm teaching. But, you know, to the point also is that I know I'm not, what I do, I know I may not resonate with every single student. And what I tell the kids is it's okay. We're all going to have different opinions on things. What's not okay is that we disrespect each other. And so, yeah, I do. I think I'm making a difference. I mean, the, the program's growing and the district has now contacted me to try and incorporate this program into other schools. So, I, I, again, I, I think it should be within all schools. Sounds like you do an amazing job, I'll just say, from where we've, what we've seen. I would love Sarah, for you to come down and see. <laughs> as soon as we can, we will. I know. Sarah, just come in and observe. I mean, we have a lot of Socratic seminars, so I'll pose questions to them. You know, and things like um, in the beginning of the lesson, I will just give them, you know, the kids today and even adults, what are we doing? We're just, you know, going through Twitter and going through our feeds and we're reading headlines and we're just automatically making judgments and opinions based on that headline without knowing the stories behind those. And so I'm teaching the kids to, you know, step back a little bit and learn the situation first before we go in and jump in and assume something that maybe isn't clearly there. Uh, Lynn, Sarah, take us into a micro situation because the decisions you're making greatly affected me yesterday. The decisions you've made greatly affected me and my opinions and my perception yesterday. And every edit, every choice of interview is one of those decisions. So you have the macro version of here's the story I'm telling, and then you have the micro version of here are the individual elements. And I know that if I record this this way or take that reaction shot, shot instead of this one, I'm skewing the conversation. And because you're dealing with so many different ideas compressed into such a small space, and you don't have the interactivity that a teacher does, you can't ask and answer and ask and answer a question. How do you think about that? And if you can, give us a very specific example from College Behind Bars or from another of the films you've made. Sarah, you Tough want to first? No? <laughs> oh, gosh. Well, the, the first thing I just want to say, thank you for pointing that out, because, you know, I remember sitting in a movie theater watching a film that Ken Burns made almost 40 years ago and thinking it was about Huey Long and just it, it un it unspurled, unspooled so seamlessly. I was unaware of the decision-making process. It just told the story. And then when I got into the process of making these films, I understood how carefully crafted every single moment is. And every little decision you make, the audience can turn away or get bored or whatever. So it's a constant struggle to create something, to construct a narrative, basically. We have all these pieces and we have to create something that then when you watch it, hopefully feels like that's the only way the story could have been told to you. Or, you know, it, 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 one thing leads to the next. And I think what we struggled the most with College Behind Bars was that unlike the films we made with Ken Burns, no narrator, you know, no written script. We didn't know what was gonna happen from one minute to the next of filming. And so trying to figure out each scene in its own and then scene by scene each episode. And we have to give an enormous amount of credit to our editor. So Sarah and I, produced the film, but Trisha Reedy, our editor, and her assistant, Chase Horton, they built this brick by brick, or you know, nail by nail. And um, there's so many ways in which we are grateful to them for showing us how to put it together. So I'm, you know, um, I'm struggling to think of a specific example, but Sarah will think of one. Well, I, the most obvious is um, the people whose stories we ended up telling and um, choosing the students because everyone has an amazing story and an interesting story. Um, and then of the people that we interviewed and the students we met, not all of their stories are as fully realized as others. And those were very hard choices, but we wanted to hear kind of varied voices. Have you learned something different each time you're in a classroom, each time you're hearing from Jewel or Daiwan or Shantae or Tamika? We wanted to represent a little enough of the history and the politics of the backdrop to some of what the students were addressing either in their personal interviews or in the classroom. So I think, you know, every decision we make is making a larger point and there were almost 400 hours of material that we distilled into these four hours and Ken always likes to say nothing on the cutting room floor is bad. It's just either too many notes or it doesn't fit into this, what Lynn is saying is kind of 
hopefully like a book that it has a, a narrative structure and an arc and a beginning, a middle and an end. Um, you know, I think we make the same choices in the historical films we make work. Lynn and I both are very visually oriented people. So what is that photograph saying? What is that piece of footage saying? What is its historical, you know, the responsibility of everybody thinking if we're showing an image, it must be actually that exact historical moment and when we can do that and when we don't do that. And um, I mean, these are, these are the questions that keep us up at night, but I think for College Behind Bars, for me, it, you know, is what, you know, how you learn about the students and their personal lives and, and um, showing the, the classroom scenes and which classes we filmed and which classrooms scenes were bigger than others and just how you tie the various um, questions we were asking as we went along. So, Jewel, you've seen the film, but you're also in the film. Yes. So take it from both of those perspectives, and there may be even more than that. When you're watching the film, you lived that life. That's your story. That's your friend's story. That's the place you were. Did it, did the film accurately re represent sort of your inner mind? Or did you suddenly find yourself going, you know, I never looked at it that way. Like what, what was happening as you're watching, knowing that you're part of the story? So I never I, get to ask that question. I love that question. So it's so amazing that I have recollection of before the film and after the film. <laughs> During the film is kind of uh, uh, fuzzy. Uh, however, I will say this. I remember approaching the film with sincerity, coming from my heart, wanting this story. I wanted people, I knew it was important for people to see guys in prison doing what they were doing. But now that I watch the film from the outside, I actually look at myself and see how much I've grown from that point as well. So there's a way in which I listen to myself speak and see the things I'm saying and say, wow, I've come so far from that point, you know? So I think, you know, there's always that learning aspect with anything that you're engaged with. And there's that reflection of, okay, this is telling me something, what, where am I now? But just to answer your question uh, to the point of, you know, uh, uh, what what happens when I watch the film? Uh, I really don't like seeing myself recorded or hearing my voice, so I don't watch it that much. But when I in in, in a few times when I have to watch it, there's that element of, wow, I have grown so much since that point. Uh, and imagine how much I grew to get to that point where I was saying and doing the things in the in the film. So that that's what occurs with me. Owen, Raven, you've seen the film, which probably means you've seen Jewel. Now you've kind of spent a little bit of time together. Um, take us on the inside and outside of that. And Maura, I'm gonna ask you to kind of do the same in a minute, but let's, let's have Owen and Raven do it first. Well, just seeing like, seeing how each person's story unfolds throughout the film. And then this is, the third per this is the third person I've um, had a Zoom call with um, from the show, um, and so like I, I so I get their personal experiences on the film, and then I get who they are here, and I just think the film does a great job portraying who they are and how they mean way more than just being in prison. Like how I education in prison, I think that film definitely opened my eyes to like we should try to do this more often more often t for more people because it gives it also gives people um it gives people a big reason to not try not do the bad things that they did to go back in jail once they it gives them a reason to live after jail it gives them a good reason it gives them a job it gives them something to work for when they're in prison when they're in prison and when they also leave prison raven Um, yeah, he pretty much said what I wanted to say. It's also the, you, Jewel is also the third person that I've met from the show, and you guys did an amazing job at portraying everyone, their personality, just, you guys are just so kind, compassionate, intelligent, and 
yeah, I don't, it was just, you guys just did a great job. Maura, thank you. Uh, Maura, so much of the process that, that Lynn described and that Lynn and Sarah described about the editing, the choices and all that, you're making those choices in real time with a group of people who may or may not understand what you're talking about or may or may not want to listen. Close us out. Tell us what that, how, how do you think about that? I'll be honest with you, I think most of the students who sign up for this class think they're signing up for just the peer tutoring part. I don't think they really truly understand what they're walking into once they get there. And I can see Owen shaking his head, yes. They don't really understand what's behind my purpose and my reason for this. And I have to say one of the, I mean, I love so much about this film and there's not a question in my mind. I will be using this alongside into my curriculum semester after semester until you know I can keep adding on. So the more I learn, the better teacher I am to help those students. And one of the things I really liked about this film and that I would do while we were reading Just Mercy is that they show us the other side. So when you think of Tamika's mom, who's really upset that you know she's in prison and why is she getting a college degree, but you know her mom has to go out and pay for the other children's uh, college degrees, how is that fair? You know, so we talk about all these different essential questions in the classroom. You know, when, when is it right to give redemption and grace to people? When is it not, you know? And there are kids who agree with Tamika's mom, and then there are our students who say, yeah, but look, I mean, if BPI has a recidivism rate of, and I don't, it's either two, three or four percent, two percent, two percent. I mean, that to me is just mind blowing. And like Owen said, I don't know why we're not doing this throughout. So, you know, the, I think the average within the first year is 47% go back into prison. If I'm correct, I don't know if that's the exact number, but I want to say it's 47% after the first year go back into prison. BPI, it's 2%. So obviously something is working. And I can be honest with you, and Raven and Owen will know this as well, my plan for next year is to continue working with the book, continue bringing in College Behind Bars, and then every year I do a capstone project with the kids. It's great that we read the book, and it's great that we've seen the film, but now what? What do we do with all of this information? And so they've done things from seminars, they've done things to, and we've invited the mayor of Charlotte, we've invited uh, area you know, superintendents and administration and students and faculty, just opening their eyes and engaging in that conversation and all of those conversations that we have to have. And so one of the things I want to do for next year, and it's really stemming from College Behind Bars, is to work with the Mecklenburg County Sheriff's Office and finding out, okay, what are we doing for our prisoners here within Charlotte Mecklenburg? So that's, that's my goal for next year is now, okay, what's next? Because the more we learn, the more we grow. And okay, now what's the next step? And I need to keep going with this because, I mean, Jewel is a perfect example. And the others coming out of this program are perfect examples of what it means to educate and rehabilitate while in prison so that they come out and that they are um, you know, community members who are prosperous and who are learning and I'm not worried about someone knocking on my door or you know, driving down the road. It's just it's something to me, if, if my tax dollars are gonna be spent anyway, I'd rather they be spent to educate and rehabilitate and not punish and then they come back out and go right back in. One more question, then we're going to go out, and it's to Sarah and Lynn, because you mentioned Capstone Project, and you guys have, have had the opportunity to go to work and learn every single day in ways that almost nobody else in any business are able to do, but you've been able to do it and also have the resources to do it. So take yourself out of the next film or the one after that because i know you guys have a very aggressive schedule and you look out further in the distance than any media organization i know what's your capstone project what's the thing that you if you had the time abundant time what do you want to learn and uh sarah or lynn you go first or second and then uh and then we'll quickly say goodbye I'm not sure I, I don't, not sure I feel comfortable totally answering that question. I think there are a lot of films that I want to make. I think um, there's a lot to learn. I don't, I don't really have an answer for that. So I'm going to, I'm going to punt. Is it a film you want to make or is it something else you want to do? I, I don't know. I don't know. I mean, I, I think doing what we do for all the reasons we've talked about today is I feel very fortunate to have this job. And Lynn and I spent a lot of time talking about films that, 
we'd like to make are different ways to use our craft and do what we do, um, both on television and the education space. I, um, yeah, I don't, I don't really have an answer for that. Lynn, do you? Uh, we have a whole list of projects, current and future, which are very exciting and probably will shift around, but um, there are some things that are very dear to my heart that I hope to get to do. But I think, and listening to Sarah speak, I mean, one thing I really hope to do is someday, if I'm not making films anymore, or even if I am, to get to teach at BPI again, or teach in another program like that, because that was one of the most rewarding experiences I've had in my entire career. And it, it was such a privilege, and I learned so much, and it was one of the hardest things I've done. So, in fact, I would look forward to hopefully being able to do that again at some point. Jewel, do you have a capstone project sitting in your hand, in your head? Yes, I want to make the uh, second version of College Behind Bars. <laughs> there you go. All right. On that note, uh, we went a little bit longer today than we typically do. And as is our tradition, we'll roll credits, but we'll hang out for a few minutes and, um, and just sort of informally go, what did we just do for an hour? So thank you all very much. We will see you next week, Thursday at 4 o'clock. Thank you. demand episodes, and more, visit our website. Kids on Earth contains hundreds of video interviews with students from around the world. Learning Revolution is a global collaboration network for people who care about learning. Be sure to join us next Thursday for a new episode of Reinventing School. Thanks for watching.